The Battle of Breitenfeld or First Battle of Breitenfeld. It was the Protestants' first major victory of the Thirty Years' War. The victory ensured that the German states would not be forcibly reconverted to Roman Catholicism. It confirmed Sweden's Gustavus Adolphus of the House of Varso as a great tactical leader and induced many Protestant German states to ally with Sweden against the German Catholic League led by Maximilian I, Elector of Bavaria, and the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II, prelude to the Swedish phase of the Thirty Years' War. If the first phase of the Thirty Years' War hinged on the Palatine inheritance, this phase hinged on the liberties of various bishoprics in Lorraine and the autonomy of several Lutheran princes including imperial electors of Saxony and Brandenburg. The issue was not only about religion, although it manifested itself in the princely religious autonomy. At issue was the larger problem of imperial rule versus princely autonomy. At its most basic, the argument was over the nature of power and authority in the Holy Roman Empire. Swedish phase of the Thirty Years' War The Swedish phase of the Thirty Years' War began with the Swedish landing at Pienemunde. The Swedish campaign in Central Europe gained control of a great deal of territory. There were three major battles, Breitenfeld, Lech, and Lutzen. On 23 January 1631, French and Swedish negotiators concluded the Treaty of Barmulder whereby France would subsidize the Swedish war effort. This marked a major shift away from a religious-based conflict, as the French were also Catholic. After the defeat at the Battle of Nordlingen, France actively joined the Thirty Years' War. Therefore this phase is sometimes referred to as the French phase. However, the Swedish army recovered to defeat the Imperial Army e.g. at the Battle of Wittstock and the Battle of Yankov. It is therefore more appropriate to label the subsequent phase of Franco-Swedish phase. Gustav's plan when he had planned this invasion in 1629 after peace with Poland, with money in his pocket and promises of French subsidy. Gustav ruled an orderly and loyal country, he possessed reserves of war material, and he had at his command an effective, well-disciplined fighting force made up of recruits from Sweden and Finland and thus loyal to him. Gustav's efforts in Poland and Lithuania did not secure his Baltic possessions, nor did they solve his kingdom's security issues. Polish, Lithuanian and English ships continued to prey upon Swedish trade and Gustav considered his engagement in the Protestant causes in the German states to be part and parcel to securing his own interests in the Baltic. Initially, Sweden's entrance into the war was considered a minor annoyance to the Catholic League and its allies. His only battles to this point had been inconclusive ones, or fought against generals of modest military ability, such as at Honigfeld, a minor affair in eastern Prussia against imperial troops under Hans Georg von Arnhem Boitzenberg to aid Sigismund III of Poland Lithuania, which ended in autumn 1629 with the Truce of Oldmark. Consequently, when Gustav Adolf and his force of 13,000 landed at Pienemunde in 1630, the imperial commander of the German Catholic League, Tilly, did not immediately respond, being engaged in what seemed to be more pressing matters in northern Italy. Gustav's sole ally was the city of Stralsund, and over the ensuing months, the situation did not improve. While he could claim the support from German princes, these were the dispossessed, like Mecklenburg and Saxe Weimar, the expectant, like the claimants to Brunswick Lunenburg, the occupied, like Magdeburg, and the threatened, like Hesse Castle. In terms of real support of money, men, supplies, and arms, these alliances meant little. External alliances were little better. Russia offered duty free grain to be sold in Amsterdam, a scheme that raised only 78,000 thalers, and France hedged its bets. The difficulty in developing concrete alliances with German states was understandable. Unthreatened Lutheran princes saw the advantage in using the Swedish menace to wrest terms from Vienna, rather than commit what amounted to acts of treason.
French reticence at entering an alliance was less understandable for, like Sweden, France had been engaged in several decades of fighting. So peace and demobilization offered significant advantages, like Sweden, though. There were significant and concrete gains to be achieved in territory, influence, and prestige, if they were to be on the winning side of the renewal of fighting in Northern Europe. In early 1631, imperial forces captured Mantua, effectively ending the Mantuan War, and the ensuing peace treaty at Cherasco ensured that the large imperial army tied up in northern Italy was now free to expend its energy in the German states, creating alliances when the Protestant princes showed little interest in attaching themselves to the Swedish cause. Gustavus opted for rough wooing, his troops moved south into Brandenburg taking and sacking the towns of Custine and Frankfurt and der Oder. It was too late and too far to save one of Gustav's occupied allies, Magdeburg, from a horrific sack by imperial troops, beginning on May 20, in which a major portion of the population was murdered and the city burned. The Swedes turned the sack of Magdeburg to good use. Broadsides and pamphlets distributed throughout Europe ensured that prince and pauper alike understood how the emperor, or at least his troops, treated his Protestant subjects. Over the next few months, Gustav consolidated his bridgehead and expanded across northern Germany, attracting support from German princes and building his army from mercenary forces along the way. By the time he reached the Saxon border, his force had grown to over 23,000 men. Strategic importance of Saxony In order for Swedes to attack the imperial troops in the south, they needed to pass through Saxony. In order for Tilly's forces, now freed from northern Italy, to attack Gustav's army, they too needed to pass through Saxony. The electorate of Saxony had not been affected by war and had large quantities of resources that each army could utilize. In midsummer, General Tilly asked John George I for permission to pass through the territory. The elector declined permission, noting that Saxony had not been ravaged by war yet. Later Tilly invaded the electorate of Saxony due to the fact that it was the shortest distance between his army and Gustav's and it possibly nulled the chance of a potential alliance between Saxony and the Swedes. His plan was to avoid contact with the Swedes, and ultimately the Saxons, until his troops could unite with the units near Jena, and the larger force of Count Otto von Fugger, en route from Hesse. Gustav and John George united their forces, planning to meet Tilly somewhere near Leipzig. 17th century forces This period of warfare had three basic branches in land forces, infantry, cavalry, and artillery. They had a relative balance, with the cavalry having much greater strength offensively than defensively and the infantry the opposite. Mostly, artillery was a supporting branch, delivering a slow rate of fire at very long range, and highly immobile. Infantry Infantry had two basic types, light and heavy, from the ancient classical period until the late 17th century. Light troops used primarily ranged weapons while heavy infantry specialized in melee combat. Generally, light troops had less armor than heavy troops, but the types are not classified by armor. Some units of mixed type employed ranged or close weapons depending on the tactical situation, but they were a minority. There were dozens of specific types in use in every period. Most nations or regions commonly specialized in fielding specific variations, differing in specific weapons, armor, and tactics used. The forces employed at Breitenfeld on both sides used mostly one type of light infantry, musketeers armed with matchlock muskets. Matchlock muskets of the period were still her heavy weapon, not the lighter flintlock variety that would eventually evolve, typically with barrels about four feet long and propaking a ball weighing about two ounces, the gun itself weighing between 15 and 17 pounds. The rate of fire was comparatively slow, typically around one round per minute. 
and musketeers were typically deployed in six or more ranks to allow for a continuous stream of fire. Musketeers typically lacked any form of protection. Although some might have worn light helmets and buff coats, they carried cheap swords or sidearms. Although the buttstock of a reversed musket was often more effective in close combat situations, the Swedes and the Imperials also used mostly the same type of heavy infantry, pikemen. Pikemen of the period employed 16 to 18 foot pikes and wore heavy half armor, ideally consisting of a breast and back plate with thigh protecting tassets and a light helmet, and also a short sword for close combat. Combined together these mixed infantry units were very strong defensively against any form of cavalry attacks. The musketeers had a greater range and rate of fire than a mounted man with a wheel lock pistol, while pikes have greater reach compared to cavalry swords and lances. Historically most infantry were organized with units of a single type, but in this case, both sides fielded units with a mixture of light and heavy troops. The Imperials deployed their infantry in modified Spanish tercios. These units were rectangular, about 1,500 men, with a dense center of pikemen and four sleeves of musketeers deployed on each sides or corners. Such a formation had very powerful all-around defenses against cavalry, but was very slow-moving and lacked firepower since at best only half of the available muskets could be brought to bear. The Swedes deployed the infantry in brigades, a concept developed by Gustavus Adolphus. Swedish infantry were deployed with six ranks of musketeers to the front and five ranks of pikemen behind. The Swedish musketeers had also perfected the salvo firing technique, in which three ranks of musketeers fired simultaneously, with the front rank kneeling, the second rank crouching and the third rank standing. The massive disruption caused by such a wall of lead slamming into the enemy was capable of stopping cavalry charges without the aid of pikes on many occasions, and allowed the Swedish pikemen or cavalry to immediately gain advantage over their opponent in the subsequent close combat. The tactical preferences of the two armies resulted from different operational philosophies. The Imperial infantry were typically more static and defensive in battle, while the Swedish were more capable of offense but more vulnerable to flanking attacks. Most of the Saxon units were various heavy types deployed in unmixed squares, with only a few companies of musketeers. Cavalry There were many different types of cavalry in the period. Similarly to the infantry, they differed in the weapons, armor and tactics employed, with cavalry, especially, unit names such as, heavy cavalry, are often misleading. The cavalry of both sides at Brighton Field were mostly units of cuirassiers. This was a heavy type of cavalry armed with wheel lock pistols and broadswords and ideally clad in heavy three-quarter armor with a bulletproof cuirass. The second type of cavalry commonly used in Western Europe at the time was the Harquebusia, a light firearm equipped cavalryman named after the long firearm they used. Theoretically, in battle the Harquebusiers would provide supporting fire for the Quirazis' charge, and their role was otherwise confined to skirmishing, scouting and other irregular operations. The cuirassiers themselves often employed caracol tactics, advancing to the charge at a trot, often in a dense formation six or ten ranks deep. At about ten paces from the opposing formation the troopers would discharge their pistols and wheel around to reload, allowing the next rank to also fire. Only after an enemy had been substantially weakened or disordered would they draw their swords and charge. It should be noted though that Tilly was an enthusiastic supporter of shock tactic by heavy cavalry, and the Imperial cavalry during this battle most likely sought to close rapidly into melee rather than shooting from a distance with their pistols, exactly like the Swedish.
Practical realities faced by the Swedish, however, resulted in their cavalry being uniquely different. Sweden's lack of manufacturing capability at the time resulted in her cavalry lacking an armor and wheel lock pistols. The Swedish cuirassiers were only armored up to the standard of the typical imperial harquebusier. Initially they were also largely outnumbered by their imperial counterparts and thus often were forced to form up only two or three ranks deep to avoid being outflanked. The Swedes also had plenty of experience fighting against the vaunted Polish cavalry, which taught them the value of a full gallop charge using cold steel only. Also, to compensate for the lesser quality and quantity of his cavalry against the Poles, Gustavus started using detached companies of musketeers to provide fire support for his horsemen. These tactical developments would prove extremely effective, and while not Swedish by invention were brought into renown by them and would shape Western military doctrine until the early 19th century. Artillery The artillery of the period used no explosive projectiles. Cannon generally fired directly at low angle with solid metal or stone shot. Artillery was mostly used for siege operations as it was very slow to maneuver. Used against opposing troops, a common tactic was the grazing shot. Aim to skip off the ground in front of the enemy and bounce upward through the massed troops, causing many more casualties than level fire could. The Swedes had developed more modern models for their siege artillery that were easier to maneuver and load, using only three different weight of ordnance, 24, 6 and 3 pounders. Additionally the Swedes had some of their lighter pieces integrated into their infantry formations at brigade and regimental level. These three pound pieces were much smaller, lighter and less powerful than the siege guns. The three-pound pieces could maneuver with the infantry to a limited degree. Three-pounders could also be reloaded much more quickly than siege pieces and had greater range and firing rate than the infantry's muskets, greatly increasing the Swedish infantry's firepower. Tactical Overview The Battle of Breitenfeld I was overall a meeting engagement with both combatants agreeing to battle on the field. The forces all had different structural organization. The level of technology was roughly equivalent, with newer, lighter cannon and matchlocks giving the Swedes a slight advantage. Both armies were well supplied, and the terrain gave neither a distinct advantage. Key differences between Imperial forces and the Swedes and their allies were in the training and structure of infantry, and in the Swedish innovations of deploying infantry with cavalry and, more importantly, to deploy the infantry in brigades that were thinner and more agile than the tertio. Forces deployed The forces deployed were roughly equal in strength. The Protestant coalition, including the Swedes and Germans, fielded about 42,000 troops, and the Imperial Army about 35,000. The Protestants had a considerable edge in cavalry numbers, about 13,000 to 9,000. Strength of heavy artillery was comparable, with the Swedes having a slight edge in quality and imperial forces a marginal advantage in quantity. The Swedes had additional small artillery pieces integrated into their infantry brigades and regiments giving them a larger number of tubes overall. The Catholics had a considerable advantage in the number of trained infantry deployed, about 25,000 to the Swedes 15,000. The Saxons fielded about 9,000 and trained conscripts and militiamen, and had very few muskets. The Swedish brigade had more matchlocks and fewer pikemen than the imperial tertio overall. The Unionists fielded about the same number of matchlocks as Imperial troops. Force assessment The overall balance was relatively even. The disparity in overall numbers resulted from large levies of untrained soldiers. The number of heavy cannon was relatively close with the Swedish having newer models and light cannon compensating for the disparity in heavy field pieces. The Unionists had a considerable advantage in cavalry while the Imperials had a considerable advantage in trained infantry. With the forces deployed, the key difference was the light, heavy infantry ratio of Swedes. 
the Swedes fielded considerably more muskets by ratio, had more advanced equipment, and better drills to increase their rate of fire. More important, the linear formation that allowed most musketeers to engage, while less than half in a tertio could engage. Disposition of forces The Swedes deployed their 15,000 infantry in brigades and two lines. The Imperial Army deployed 25,500 infantry in a single line of 17 tertios. The German allies extended the Swedish-Saxon front to be overall slightly longer than the Catholic. The Imperial line had its cavalry evenly distributed on its flanks. The Swedes had their cavalry weighted to their right. The Saxon allies fielded their infantry in wedge formation with units in squares and cavalry on the flanks. With their Saxon allies extending the Swedes' line, the Unionists had cavalry at the center and the flanks.